in 1889, May 1st was chosen by the Second International to be the day to honor workers the globe over. It's officially known as International Workers' Day to uh, commemorate the Haymarket Massacre. So let's start with some basics. Who or what is the Second International? We talk about this a lot. We talk about Bakunin and Marx fighting at the Second International, right? But we never really get into it very much. The Second International was the organization of socialists and labor parties that met and formed in Paris on July 14th, 1889. Delegates from 20 uh, countries participated. It continued with the work of uh, the dissolved First International, but unfortunately excluded the relatively powerful anarcho-syndicalist movement. We know why. It officially reformed in 1922 and became the Labor and Socialist International, lasting until about 1940. Now, don't get me wrong, I hold many differences with the rank and file of these organizations. They were generally pro, uh, pro-colonialism, excluded what I consider to be brothers in ideology, the anarcho-syndicalists, and had member countries that took a little too long to condemn Nazism, to put it lightly. Now, but onto the show. What's the Haymarket Massacre, aka the Haymarket Affair? Well, that's a bit of a big thing, actually. It's one part protest, one part tragedy, one part sham, and one part mystery. So strap in. This is kind of a story. Um, On May 4th, 1886, at Haymarket Square in Chicago, Illinois, the day began with a peaceful rally in support of workers striking for an eight-hour workday. The primary organizing group behind this movement were the Knights of Labor, It was a group that rejected socialism and radicalism, but supported the eight-hour workday idea. During the labor slowdown that had begun several years earlier in 1882 and was still going all the way into 1886, their organization had grown immensely from 70,000 to, in total, over 700,000 workers. This was a large group of organized, downtrodden workers. In other words, a threat. They were, there were also several thousand anarchists at the time in Chicago to boot. This was sort of the heyday. It was leading into the heyday of labor movements. The, as I, you've heard me talk many times, the late 1880s to the 1920s. Right? This, this was the heyday of the labor market. This, this is when we got shit done. You see, this particular rally was spurned on by something we can all appreciate in modern America, the actions of police. More specifically, the police killing one protesting worker and injuring eight the prior day. See, we've talked about that before on this channel, the big stick, the origins of modern policing in America, how you have the slave patrols in the south and the big stick in the north, the big stick being the um, organized uh, means of breaking labor movements. The police foundations literally being built upon the uh, commerce and merchant class and how they would fund and buy all of the equipment, pay for the payroll, all of that sort of stuff. The big stick, this is what they used. They used it to kill a protesting worker and injure eight to try and break up this protest in uh, in the Haymarket Square. So following the incidents of the prior day, protesters began to rally in support of striking workers. Here's where shit goes off the rails. Now, as I tell you these next events, I want you to know ahead of time that to this very day, we don't know who took these actions, despite the very public trial that took place. Someone threw a bomb. As I said, we don't know who threw that bomb to this day. There are two suspected groups. One, a contingent of mostly German-speaking anarchists centered around a newspaper called Arbiter Zeitung. Sorry, sorry, sorry Germans, sorry. Arbiter Zeitung, um, who admittedly had been into building and researching bombs, but by all accounts likely didn't throw the bomb due to a few factors we'll discuss later on. Two, the Pinkertons, a.k.a. the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. 
Now, anyone familiar with a certain era of Hollywood movies and one fairly popular video game has likely heard this name more than a few times. <clears throat> the Pinkerton National Detective Agency is infamous in labor circles. They were founded by one Alan Pinkerton in 1850. They're still around as a subsidiary of Sir uh, Securitas AB. They became famous when Pinkerton claimed to have foiled a plot to assassinate, uh, assassinate President-elect Abraham Lincoln, who would go on to hire the agency for personal security during the Civil War. Notice the language there. He claimed. See, there wasn't any truly hard evidence as to the existence of that plot, and historical scholars to this day debate as to whether it was a complete fabrication or not. Many think he just made it up. The Pinkertons went on to become, quite literally, the world's largest private law enforcement organization at the height of its power. Now, here's where it gets obvious and interesting. Pinkertons became quite famous for one particular set of services. Union busting. Specifically, infiltration, disorganization, and violent confrontation with unionized workers. They would do just about anything at the behest of their capitalistic masters. People whose names you're guaranteed to recognize, such as Carnegie and Rockefeller. They worked for oil, mining, steel, and any other form of industry that could somehow, uh, that could somehow endow someone with the title of a robber baron at the time. The Pinkerton's active and reserve agents outnumbered the standing army of the United States. <clears throat> this agency delivered results by any means necessary, time and again. So, we have our two likely groups, but remember, as I said, to this day, even professional historians admit no one knows exactly what went down. The formal rally began under a light rain on, in the evening of May 4th with August Spies, Albert Parsons, and Samuel Fielden speaking to a crowd of 600 to 3,000 people, not entirely sure, while standing on a wagon adjacent to the square on De Plains Street. At this point, there was a large contingent of officers observing from nearby. Paul Average, a historian who specializes in the study of anarchism, adds context to this situation. There seems to be to prevail uh, there seems to prevail the opinion in some quarters that this meeting had been called for the purposes of inaugurating a riot. Hence the warlike preparations on the part of the so-called law and order. However, let me tell you that at the beginning that this meeting had not been called for any such purpose. The object of the meeting was to explain the general situation of the 8-hour movement and to throw light upon various incidents in connection with it. End quote. Following Spies' uh, speech came Parson, an Alabama-born editor of The Alarm, an English-language weekly. At this point, the crowd was so calm that the mayor of Chicago at the time, Carter Harrison Sr., had stopped by to watch, and then finding of nothing, uh, nothing of particular note, walked home early. Parsons spoke for about an hour before the last speaker of the evening, British-born Samuel Field, and delivered a brief 10-minute address as the weather was deteriorating and the crowd was growing weary of it. Now, all of the objective first-hand reports confirm this. So we're going to skip ahead slightly to mention some of the national press that covered the events that will follow. The New York Times ran an article entitled Rioting and Bloodshed in the Streets of Chicago, which claimed Fielden's words grew wilder and more violent as he proceeded for double the length actually true in the event. Another New York Times article ran with the headline Anarchist Red Hand, and opened with the villainous teachings of the anarchists bore bloody fruit in Chicago tonight, and before daylight, at least a dozen stalwart men have laid down their lives as tribute. It called the strikers a mob and used quotations around the terms workers and working men. So, what happened? As close to exactly as we can get. At about 10.30 p.m., just as Fielden was wrapping up his speech, police arrived en masse and began marching in formation at the speaker's wagon, ordering the rally to disperse. Sound familiar? Seen these tactics recently? 
the police inspector John Bonfield announced loudly, quote, I command you in the name of law to desist and to disperse. It was at that moment that a homemade bomb with a brittle metal casing filled with dynamite ignited by a fuse was thrown into the path of the advancing police. Cue the clusterfuck. It exploded. Killing police, uh, policeman Matthias J. Deegan near instantly and mortally wounding six other officers. <clears throat> What ensued, though, was far, far worse. Witnesses maintained that following the detonation of the explosive, there was an exchange of gunfire. Lots and lots of gunfire. Accounts vary between whether there was, an, uh, there was even any fire coming from the protesters at all. In fact, an anonymous police official informed the Chicago Tribune at the time, quote, a very large number of police were wounded, by each other's revolvers. It was every man for himself, and while some got two or three squares away, the rest emptied their revolvers mainly into each other. The end result of the menagerie of Copdom was four dead, 70 wounded, 60 of them police. So, all in all, Seven police officers, four workers dead on site, with another dying two years later due to complications that never resolved. Cause and effect. Problem, reaction, solution. So what happened next, you may ask? <clears throat> exactly what would benefit everyone involved? Well, everyone except for the workers, of course. What came next was a brutally harsh clamping down on unions. A massive outpouring of support for the police involving many thousands of dollars being donated and effusive support being shown from the local and national businesses in the forms of generous donations. The entire labor and immigrant communities were immediately considered fair game and were targets by police involving raids on their homes and offices, resulting in dozens of unrelated arrests. In the process, such formalities as arrest warrants and search warrants were cast aside and ignored. The Chicago PD spent eight weeks shaking down every labor hall, meeting place, and place of business that any known union activist ever set foot in. During this, this civil rights nightmare scenario, a small group of anarchists who involved themselves in the making of bombs was discovered. Now, this wasn't that uncommon of a strategy, actually, in mining protests to set off a bomb in one section of the mine to set back or halt production. It's actually fairly common for the time. So, following the assumption that the anarchists were clearly responsible for what had occurred, they set about proving it. On the morning of May 5th, they raided the office of Arbiter Zetang, arresting <clears throat> its editor, August Spies, and his brother, whom they didn't charge. They also arrested the editorial assistant, Michael Schwab, and Adolf Fischer, a typesetter. The resultant search of the premises was that they found incriminating evidence in the form of propaganda and what they titled a, quote, revenge poster, all used by prosecution later. On May 7th, the police searched the premises of a Lewis Ling, where they found bombs and bomb-making materials. As well as Ling, an associate of Spies, Balthazar Rao, suspected as also somehow the bomber, was traced to Omaha and brought back to Chicago. Rao quickly be, uh, became one of the linchpins in this case, as after spending some alone time with the police, he confessed to having experimented with dynamite bombs and that the defendants had implanted, uh, implemented a code word, the German word for peace, in a previous iteration of the newspaper as a call to arms. Problem one. No evidence of this embedded code was ever found. Two. Problem two. Not a single witness recalled the German word, word Ruhe ever being uttered in any speech. Nobody ever said it. So, in the interim, 
The police have also, uh, also have more suspects they've gathered up. More importantly is Rudolf Schnaubelt. They're now leads a, a suspect for the bomb thrower. Feel free to roll your eyes now. They just are cycling through lead suspects. They had arrested Schnaubelt twice earlier, and by May 14th, he had fled the country. William Salinger, who had turned state's evidence again after spending some quality time with the Chicago PD, was granted immunity. On June 4th, 1886, the eight suspects were indicted by grand jury, which is anyone who's paid a lick of attention to attempts to try police for crimes in America know to be a joke unto themselves. And they then stood trial for being accessories to the murder of Officer Dagan. Of the eight rounded up, <clears throat> only two had actually been present when the bomb went off. August Spies and Samuel Fielden, who were busy steeping, uh, stepping down from the speaker's wagon in full view of the police at the time, Two others had been present at one point in the rally, but had been confirmed to have left early and had solid alibis for their locations as well. One other thing to note about these men was that only one was American-born, a man called Oscar Nieb. All the rest, immigrants. The trial was a sham. There's no other way to put it. It began on June 21st and went on to August 11th. Here's where all historians agree. The trial was a blatant miscarriage of justice. It occurred in what has been described as, quote, an atmosphere of extreme prejudice by both the public and media towards the defendants. It was presided over by Judge Joseph Gary who displayed brazen open hostility towards the defendants, consistently ruling for the prosecution, throwing out any contradictory evidence, and failing to maintain judicial decorum in the form of openly speaking against the defendants during proceedings. One of the motions that was put forth by, uh, to try the defendants separately, denied of course, selection of the jury was interesting, to say the least. It lasted three weeks in total with nearly 1,000 people called. All union members, anyone who expressed union sympathies or was related to or associated with union members or socialistic tendencies, whatever that may have meant, were dismissed outright. In the end, a jury of 12 were seated. All, I repeat, all of them confessed prejudice against the defendants. Despite those professions, of course, Judge Gary impaneled that jury. Exhausting the preemptory challenges of the defense, the trial moved forward. One of the mainstay arguments of the prosecution, when Julius Grinnell, was that despite even if they had no knowledge of actions that may take place, since the defendants had not actively discouraged the throwing of the bomb that they may not have known existed, they were equally guilty. All in all, the jury heard the testimony of 118 people, primarily the Chicago PD, comprising 54 of the witnesses. Finally, some of the defendants themselves, Fielden, Schwab, Spies, and Parson. It was during these witness testimonies that Albert Parson's brother had his opportunity to bring forth evidence that he had that the Pinkertons were directly involved as the evidence was disallowed earlier. This attempt was squashed as well. You see, it was fairly common knowledge amongst the strikers and the protesters that a Pinkerton agent had been present and thrown the bomb, but since all witness accounts to that were stricken, it has effectively become lost to history to a large extent since no one ever got the chance to pursue the lead. Oh, and one last great piece of shit fuckery to top off this mountainous pile of shit fuckery is the fact that the police investigator, Captain Michael Schock, who led this investigation, 
was dismissed from the police force for fabricating evidence in this case, but was reinstated in 1892. Of course, the jury returned a guilty verdict for all. Judge Gary, may he be rotting in hell as we speak, sentenced seven of the defendants to death by hanging and one to 15 years in prison. Want to guess which one escaped the death penalty? Yeah, that's right, our American-born friend. The result of the verdict provoked outrage amongst the labor organizations and unions the world over resulting in protests literally around the world and framing the men as martyrs to the cause. The trial, in combination with the sensationalist reporting and the lies put forth by Captain Shock in, a, in an account he titled Anarchy and Anarchism, resulted in a, patrol, a portrayal of anarchists to be bloodthirsty foreign fanatics. Some of the highlights of the articles about the events included such language as Arch counselors of riots, pillage, murder, bloody brutes, red ruffians, bloody monsters, cowards, cutthroats, thieves, assassins, and fiends. From the Chicago Times, the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, and so, so many others, the die was cast. In fact, George Frederick Parsons of the Atlantic Monthly wrote that the workers of the country only had themselves to blame for the fears that the wholesome middle-class Americans now had of them. One prescient point that Edward Availing made was that, quote, if these men are ultimately hanged, it will be the Chicago Tribune that has done it. The case was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, where the petition was denied. Illinois Governor Richard James Oglesby, James Oglesby on November 10th, 1987, commuted the sentences of Fielden and Schwab. On the eve of Ling's execution, he managed to obtain a smuggled-in blasting cap, which he held between his teeth, much like a cigar. He bit down, detonating it. <sighs> the resulting blast took off half his face. And unfortunately, and horrifically, he survived another six hours in that excruciating state. The next day, on November 11th, 1887, four defendants, Engel, Fisher, Parson, Spies, were taken to the gallows. White robes and hoods. This always gets a little weird for me. I may get emotional. They sang Marseille the then anthem of the International Revolutionary Movement. Family members who attempted to see them one last time were arrested. Witness accounts from their final, mo uh, final moments concur on what was said. Spies shouted, the time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. In their last words, Engel and Fisher called out, hurrah, hurrah for anarchism. For told you, forgive me. Parsons requested to speak and was cut off by the signal to open the trap door. Witnesses also agree that the hanging, hanging was not done properly, so to speak. The men were left to slowly strangle to death. A sight which, by reports, scarred the witnesses and left them visibly shaken. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the convictions for conspiracy, no bomber was ever ever actually brought to trial. While some historians, mainly two, Joel and Mesher Cruz, finger Schnaubelt as the likely culprit, many others still have their doubts. So, it's at this point we find ourselves back at the beginning. It was because of these events 
and the cause that made them possible that the Second International chose May 1st to honor the Haymarket martyrs and all of the workers who had been killed in association with the strikes. It would be this day that workers of the world could act in solidarity henceforth and demonstrate and fight for a better future for themselves and their brothers and sisters. So, wipe the tears. That brings us today to today, um, Labor Day. Why is Labor Day in, all, uh, in September? Why is it not May 1st? Well, in the wake of multiple powerful global protests, there was building strength in the labor movement again. They had overcome it. They had overcome the bad press. They had overcome the machinations of the system. Countries across the world recognized International Workers' Day. Starting here, it started with an incident on our shores in America, in Chicago. People demanding an eight-hour workday led to the machinations, deaths, corrupt judicial processes, and the ultimately the hangings of martyrs. With these clashes building, this fervor growing in this country, the Washington, D.C. politicians and the business interests of this nation wanted to placate the labor movement. At the time, federal legislation to designate the Labor Day uh, a public holiday had been basically just stalled in Congress for months and months and months and months. A populist from South Dakota, um, a U.S. Senator James Kyle, um, introduced the, the bill um, to appease strikers and their supporters, and just the workers at, uh, across the board. President Cleveland, after the um, ARU joined the Pullman strike, which I'm not going to get into, but basically... The ARUs, the American Railway Union, and Pullman cars, um, basically, uh, Pullman was a brand for all intents and purposes, and striking workers refused to move the Pullman cars from one train to another, basically um, st stalling train travel, like transit across the country. Uh, when the ARU joined the Pullman strike, <coughs> commerce ground to a halt. So the bill was passed four days later. President Cleveland, who, hilariously enough, whose great-grandson my stepfather smoked his first joint with, right, these are some of the ties to these people I have, um, signed it into law that year, 1894. But it was a conciliatory measure, but it was also a distracting measure. They didn't want to associate this new holiday with the empowered labor movement and tie it to that historical knowledge, that memory of just how fucked it got. So they separated it. They, they pushed it aside. Rather than tie it to May 1st, the International Workers' Day, May 1st, May Day, the anniversary of the Haymarket Massacre, the day that the entirety of the system was shown for the corrupt entity that it was, they put it in September instead and called it Labor Day. There you go, kids. 